For the ones who work hard to ensure their crew can always go the extra mile. And the ones who get in early so everyone can go home on time. There's Granger, Offering professional-grade supplies backed by product experts so you can quickly and easily find what you need. Plus, you can count on access to a committed team ready to go the extra mile for you. Call, click Granger.com, or just stop by. Granger For the ones who get it done. When you make decisions for your company, you always look for the no-brainers. And if you have a lot of mailing and shipping to do, Stamps.com is the ultimate no-brainer. It streamlines your process to make your business more efficient, which makes you less busy. Mail checks, invoices, legal documents, books, and everything you need to keep your business running with Stamps.com. Seamlessly connect with every major marketplace and shopping cart if you sell online. Schedule package pickups through the dashboard and automatically see your cheapest and fastest shipping options from different carriers with rates up to 89% off USPS and UPS rates. And with the Stamps.com mobile app, you can take care of mailing and shipping wherever you are, even on the go. Make the same no-brainer decision as over 1 million other business decision makers with Stamps.com. Sign up at Stamps.com with code PROGRAM for a special offer that includes a four-week trial, plus free postage, and a free digital scale. No long-term commitments or contracts. That's Stamps.com, code PROGRAM. Welcome to Pax Britannica. Season 3, Episode 25, Evil as Well as Good. Welcome back to Pax Britannica. I'm your host, Dr. Samuel Hume. Before we begin today, we have new members of the House of Lords. Sharon Prothero, Countess of Albemarle, Al Zapponi, Earl of Buchan, Jonas Branders, Earl of Eglinton, Kurt Moore, Earl of Mar, Matthew Dannenberg and Sarah Lichtman, Earl and Countess of Strathmore and Kinghorn, and Greg Griffiths, Earl of Airlie. All patrons get their own premium RSS feed that lets them listen to the podcast without ads. These new earls and countesses can also access the bonus content. Go to patreon.com slash Pax Britannica to find out more. Last week, we saw how the state's navy of the Commonwealth of England and the navy of the United Provinces of the Netherlands repeatedly clashed in the English Channel and the North Sea. In each battle, the larger, heavier, and better armed ships of the state's navy bombarded the Dutch navy in a way that the smaller, lighter ships simply could not match. After the Battle of Plymouth, Admiral Mikiel de Ruta won a strategic victory by buying time for his convoy of merchant ships to escape. But at the Battle of Kentish Nock, his commanding officer was less successful. Admiral Witt Cornelius de Witt, an aggressive officer who was deeply disliked by, well, pretty much everyone, learnt that the warnings of English gunnery were not exaggerated. At Kentish Nock, Robert Blake had not been a perfect commander. In his haste to engage with de Witt, he let his fleet split up and fall out of formation, which led to the beaching of some of his vanguard. Blake had never fought de Witt, and he rushed into a fight because he didn't want the Dutch admiral to try and escape, a suggestion which de Witt would find insulting. This lost him the immediate advantage, which de Witt quickly tried to seize. With the withdrawal of the Dutch fleet the following day, de Witt had preserved it as a fighting force. Despite the celebrations in the Commonwealth, the United Provinces were still in the fight. The war was not over yet. We'll pick up where we left off, with de Witt limping back into port, with thousands of wounded and dozens of ships needing serious repair, and getting down to business. The business of blaming everyone but himself. De Witt told everyone who would listen that the only reason he'd been defeated is because too many of his captains, especially the Zealanders, were cowards. He'd seen many ships hiding behind larger vessels, firing when they could, and using their compatriots as shields from return fire. Many Zealanders, including one Vice Admiral de Ruta, resented that assertion, although as we saw last week, many Dutch ships did stay out of the thickest fighting. They would probably see discretion as the greater part of valour. 
Bravery was all very well, but it was no answer to the Sovereign's 111 guns. Churches and Hainsworth suggest that if De Witt had got his way, and the smaller ships had thrown themselves fully into the battle, he wouldn't have had a fleet afterwards. But some of De Witt's complaints had merit. His fleet had been undermanned, its officers had been inexperienced and timid when they needed to be bold. But calling Zealanders cowards, when Mikhail de Ruta was right there, as good a proof against that charge as you could ask for, was not just petulant, but unpolitic. The Dutch navy was a collection of rival admiralties, and anyone who wanted to combine them needed to be as good a diplomat as they were a naval commander. For the moment, the States General backed their man. Several officers were arrested on charges of cowardice, although the autonomy of the admiralties meant they'd eventually be released. But de Witt's days as the leading light of the Dutch Navy were running out. In the weeks after his return, de Witt's health, physical and mental, collapsed, and on the 27th of October, 1652, the States General reluctantly invited Lieutenant Admiral Martin Tromp to return to command. It wouldn't be official until the next year, and the specifics of when Trump resigned or was suspended, or when and how he took up his commission again, is hard to pin down. But we're not 17th century Dutch administrators, so all we need to know is that Trump is back in command, and once again the leading figure in the Dutch naval war, whatever his official status. As his second in command, he appointed Johan Evertsen, a Zealand officer who has been around before, but for the sake of avoiding introducing too many badly pronounced Dutch names at once, he's gone unremarked until now. Trump had not spent his short retirement relaxing. He wrote and published his account of the early war, in which he'd defended his actions earlier in the war, and which likely helped his rehabilitation. But he'd also been considering the flaws of the Dutch navy, and how to correct them. So when the States General offered him his command once again, he responded with his conditions. The States General, with few options, gave Trump most of the tools he needed. First was to stop the hemorrhage of talented Dutch sailors. With morale below the waterline, it seemed like every time a naval vessel docked, it lost half its men to desertion. Captains had taken to anchoring offshore just to give them fewer chances to, literally, jump ship. The expertise of veteran sailors was one of the Netherlands' most powerful military assets, and Trump needed them to stay at their posts. He was furious to learn that the States General had increased the pay offered to new recruits, while leaving the wages of veteran sailors unchanged. He had that fixed as soon as he could. He also toured the fleet with a public prosecutor, with the remit to investigate officers for dereliction of duty, and charge them for it. Not only would this help repeat a Kentish knock, but it did wonders for crew morale, No one likes working for a bad manager. In addition to these measures and others, morale improved by the simple fact that Trump was back in command. Daddy Trump, as his sailors called him, was loved. Old hands who had deserted since his eclipse now came back by the boatload. The second problem Trump saw was supplies. His ships were constantly undersupplied, partly because each of the five admiralties jealously guarded their victuals. Trump barreled through these administrative obstacles in a way that no one else really could. The third problem was the quality of Dutch ships. Firstly, they needed to be cleaned. Dutch ships were foul below water, meaning they were covered in mussels and barnacles and other sea life. This drastically slowed them down, and since Dutch naval strategy prioritised speed, that was a problem. The Breda Roder, taken in for dry dock repairs, had been cleaned, and half a barrel of shellfish had been torn from just her rudder. And speaking of naval strategy, that takes us to the main problem which had consumed Trump's thoughts, and it was one that didn't have a quick fix. The English fleet's strategy, big ships, big guns, was a powerful counter to the Dutch strategy of smaller, lighter ships. He proposed a solution which seems quite straightforward. The Dutch should build their own big ships, with their own big guns, which could beat the English heavies at their own game. He recommended that the States General order 30 new ships, equivalent to 6 English first rates, 12 second rates, and 12 third rates. Obviously, it took time to build ships, 
but the Dutch were some of the best shipbuilders in the world, and Churches and Hainsworth estimate that these ships would be ready for action by the autumn of the following year. That time could be used to import the guns needed for them and to train their crews. But despite an agreeable committee, which included the convalescing De Witt, who had seen firsthand how effective the big ship's big guns approach was, it ran into too much institutional resistance. The States General, and the States of Holland in particular, pushed hard against Trump's suggestions, not just because it went against traditional naval doctrine, but also because these heavy, low-sailing ships would be limited to only the deepest harbours. The building program would begin in February 1653, but it was watered down to just one first rate, no second rates, and 29 third rates, all of which were built for speed and to sit high in the water. It was more of the same, and Trump was frustrated at the lack of vision from the politicians. But over the month since returning to command on the 27th of October, Trump had worked his magic. The naval port of Helvetslaus now harboured 88 warships, with accompanying fireships and support vessels. Trump's fleet was still undermanned. The States General had outright rejected his proposal to impress merchant sailors into the fleet. And so, once Trump was at sea, he simply took what he needed. The convoy he was escorting found their protectors coming alongside, and then hundreds of sailors were told they now served at the pleasure of Daddy Trump. Where was the fleet bound? The States General still insisted on their previous strategy, convoy protection, and outlasting the English, but Trump was having none of that. He'd done that before, and it hadn't worked. With his restored fleet, he wanted a knockout fight with Blake. So leaving the convoy anchored off the French coast, Trump sailed north to find Blake and his fleet. On the other side of the Channel, the Commonwealth had celebrated the Battle of Kentish Knock like it had just won them the war. It was a strange reaction, because the English had long admired the fighting spirit of the Protestant Dutch. Their tenacity and their willingness to fight on through defeats and through the decades, they'd just won the Eighty Years' War, for goodness sake. Perhaps if the Dutch fleet had been utterly destroyed, then maybe but an inconclusive naval battle wasn't going to make them crumble after just a few months of fighting. Yet the peace party on the Council of State, which included Oliver Cromwell, were ascendant, and a diplomatic mission was sent to The Hague to hash out the details of peace. In the meantime, the Commonwealth let the strength of the navy dissolve. A lack of money was at the heart of it. The navy was owed £400,000 in wages and supplies, and there was a growing resentment among the sailors. On land, the shipbuilders who were commissioned by the Commonwealth to repair damaged ships and build new ones were not enthusiastic, because though the orders had come in, their payment hadn't. Ships were due for repair, and the queues were growing long. Freshly constructed ships were christened after the victory, with the Kentish, the Essex, the Sussex and the Hampshire launched to cheering crowds but this hid a growing hole in the Navy's finances, and there was little political will to fill it. What was the rush, when victory was just a matter of time? As Trump centralised, reinforced and prepared his fleet, the Commonwealth dispersed theirs across the world. Denmark, officially neutral but nevertheless aligned with the Dutch, had imprisoned a fleet of English merchantmen heading home with timber, pitch and hemp, vital naval supplies. A squadron of Blake's fleet was split off, sailing to Denmark to, unsuccessfully, pressure the Danes to release the ships and the cargo. In the Mediterranean, Dutch ships repeatedly bested English convoys, and the Council of State ordered another squadron of 20 ships to be sent to reinforce English positions around Italy. Blake obediently surrendered the ships, on the promise that they would soon be replaced by newly constructed warships. Warships that, because of the lack of funds, were only slowly being built. So it was, in dribs and drabs, Blake's victorious fleet of around 68 warships was reduced to about 42, at the same time that Trump was sailing out with 88 ships looking for a fight. Despite the numbers advantage, Blake was determined to give him one. Without the ones like you, who work tirelessly to keep things running, everything would suddenly stop. 
Hospitals, factories, schools, and power plants, they all depend on you. No matter the weather, emergency, or time of day, you're the ones who get it done. At Granger, we're here for you with professional grade industrial supplies. Count on real time product availability and fast delivery. Call clickgranger.com or just stop by. Granger for the ones who get it done. Say goodbye to your credit card rewards. Greedy corporate mega stores led by Walmart and Target are pushing for a law in Congress to take away your hard earned cash back and travel points to line their pockets. The Durbin Marshall Credit Card Bill would enact harmful credit card routing mandates that would end credit card rewards as we know it. If you love your credit card rewards, tell your lawmakers, hands off my rewards. Tell them to oppose the Durbin Marshall Credit Card Bill. On the 29th of November, 1652, the Dutch fleet returned to familiar waters. Anchored off the Downs, with the Straits of Dover to their west, waiting for the rising sun to illuminate their targets. The ships of Admiral Tromp looked north as the sunrise revealed the sails and flags of the state's navy. Blake's fleet likewise spotted the Dutch, and both fleets made ready to weigh anchor. At about 11am, the English fleet began to move, heading south out of the Downs and towards the Dutch. To Trump's south, a convoy of merchantmen he was meant to be escorting moved west, down the channel and against the wind. Trump followed, tacking against the wind to stay between the convoy and the state's navy. Blake saw clearly what he was doing, and he was undeterred. Both admirals wanted to fight, and both wanted to have the weather gauge on their side. What followed was a relentless push west, each fleet tacking against the wind, racing the other. The creeping advance carried the two fleets around the corner of England, and Blake clung to the shoreline, which gave him a slight advantage against the prevailing wind. However, this tactic gave him a deadline, because ahead of him was Dungeness Point, a headland which jutted out into the channel. When he reached that, he'd have to make a choice. Either give Trump the weather gauge, letting him sail away or attack as he saw fit, or turn south and into the Dutch fleet, with or without the weather gauge advantage. This was Blake. Being outnumbered two to one would not put him off a fight. The Battle of Dungeness began much like Kentish Knock, in that Blake charged headlong at the enemy, and made no attempt to marshal his ships or concentrate them for an attack. Slower ships and those captains who looked at the odds and decided, nah, not for me, were not with him. Blake's flagship, the Triumph, and the few ships which had kept up with his charge, plunged into Trump's fleet. Had Blake managed to keep his fleet together, it might have negated Trump's advantage in numbers. Ton to ton, the English ships packed a much harder punch than the Dutch ships, and Trump could only bring so many of them to bear. As it was, though, Blake had not concentrated his ships, what followed was a hard-fought series of skirmishes, boarding attempts, and point-blank broadsides. The Breda Rauder, back under Trump's command, lost her front after accidentally ramming the English garland. The crew, making the most of this, threw lines over the garland and attempted to capture it. Another English ship, the Antony Bonaventure, came to assist the garland and began boarding the Breda Rauder right back and then the Hollandia under Evertsen sailed to help the Breda Rhoda. The two English ships surrendered, the Bonaventure after her captain was killed in the boarding, and the Garland after the magazine detonated and blew half the ship and hundreds of Dutch and English sailors to pieces. It still floated, though, and Trump took prisoners from both ships and had prize crews sail them out of danger. The price of these prizes were high, not only for the losses of men and officers, but the Breda Rhoda itself was in bad shape, from the collision, from many broadsides, and from the explosion of the Garland. Blake and the Triumph struggled in the battle. Surrounded by Dutch ships, including de Ruta's, the Triumph had taken a beating. Luckily for Blake, the fighting had only started at about 3pm, and the early November sunset saved the English fleet from a worse defeat. Because it was a defeat. The English had lost three ships to capture, the Garland and the Bonaventure, but also the Hercules, which wasn't even in the fight and had been sailing between English ports for a refit when it ran into some Dutch ships. In return, the Dutch had lost one ship, which was slowly burning in the space between the fleets, 
as Trump and Blake pulled away to anchor. The next morning, Blake sailed for the Downs. He sent word to the Council of State, starting his letter with a warning. He hoped that they had, quote, hearts prepared to receive evil as well as good from the hand of God, end quote. He described the battle and reported that the Garland had been lost and its captain killed, but he didn't mention the other two losses. He did, however, offer his resignation and suggested that his successor be one of the two recent arrivals to the fleet, Major General Richard Dean and Lieutenant General George Monk. Both men had been transferred to the Navy from their positions in the Scottish occupation. From Blake's correspondence with the Council, it seems like he took the defeat of Dungeness to heart. He complained that some of his captains had not done their duty in the battle, but he also acknowledged that Trump was a dangerous adversary. He described him as, quote, so well versed in the destructive ways of hostility. Trump was determined to chase Blake in the days after the battle, but once again, the weather got in the way. From prisoners, he learned that the English fleet was still dispersed, but he knew it would not stay this way for long. At the moment, the Dutch fleet was concentrated, and the English one was not, and Trump wanted to strike before that could change. Every day counted. The dispersed ships of the state's navy were being called back. Orders to sail to distant seas were being cancelled, now that Trump had shown that the Dutch were still in this war. Ships damaged at Dungeness were being repaired in the Thames, and the estuary was already home to the Resolution and the Sovereign, the two most powerful ships in the war. They hadn't been at Dungeness. Trump needed to hit Blake now, before the state's navy could recover and concentrate their own forces. The Dutch convoy of merchant ships was still there, though, and needed protecting, so Trump begrudgingly sent a squadron to protect them as they sailed to the Ile de Ré, south of Brittany and off the coast of La Rochelle. He led the rest of his fleet up the Channel, past Dover, through the Downs, and into the Thames estuary. But here he faced the same obstacle which had stymied Blake after the Battle of Kentish Knock, shallow and unfamiliar waters. Many of his ship pilots had led Dutch trading ships through the estuary without any problems, but now they balked. Dutch warships were lighter than their English counterparts, but they weren't as light as Dutch merchantmen. The pilots didn't know the best channels for deeper draft vessels. They never needed to learn them. Trump called a council of war, and here he learned that his captains had received the same warnings. The estuary had sandbanks and shoals, which were only passable at certain tides, under certain conditions, and a raid into the Thames could very easily result in the Dutch fleet being beached and trapped. Trump, very reluctantly, called off the raid. He sailed back across the Channel, sent his most damaged ships in for repair, and then escorted another batch of merchant ships to the Ile de Ré. With Blake's fleet recuperating in the Thames, Trump made hay while the sun shined. With their defenders far away, in dry dock or at anchor, dozens of English merchant ships were captured. At one point, he even enjoyed a bit of cattle rustling. Several crews went ashore in Kent, and straight up stole sheep and cows from nearby farmers. There's an apocryphal story of Trump attaching a broom to the mast of the Braderode because he was going to sweep the channel clean of English ships. In the words of Nicholas Roger, though, quote, It cannot possibly be true. Such vainglory would have been very out of character, and the ordinary meaning of hoisting a broom to the masthead was that the ship was for sale, end quote. The confidence of the Dutch in the wake of Dungeness began to spill into overconfidence. Earlier in the year, international opinion had been firmly on the Dutch side. Not only were the English a bunch of heretical revolutionaries who had murdered an anointed king, but they were bullies, insisting on the sovereignty of their waters, violating the rights of neutral shipping in their enforcement of the Navigation Act, and blockading neutral ports and raiding neutral ships. When the war broke out, there were a lot of European merchants who hoped the Dutch would give the English a well-deserved kicking. Now, this goodwill was being squandered, because the Dutch began to act just as bad, if not worse. Many non-English ships sailing out of the Baltic, laden with naval supplies like timber and pitch, were boarded and seized by the triumphant Dutch. Even ships which weren't carrying war material, and which weren't destined for the Commonwealth, were victims of Dutch piracy. 
increasing pressure was brought to bear on Dutch allies such as Denmark to become increasingly hostile to Commonwealth trade. But just like after the Battle of Kentish Knock, when the English acted like the Dutch were beaten, the Commonwealth was not beaten. Earlier talk of peace between the two republics almost immediately ended. There was no way that the Council of State could consider peace right after a defeat like Dungeness. This was a revolutionary government structured around the military. They could always find more men and more money if they needed it. Next week, the fortunes of war will turn once again. The defeat of Dungeness will spur the Council of State into action, and the state's navy will expand once again. Thank you to my House of Lords, including the King's favourite, Mike Sanders, the Duchess of Wellington, Sue Bremner, the Marquess of Beaumont and Cressford, Philip Allen, and the Countess of Clarendon, Mandy Wright. Go to patreon.com slash Pax Britannica to join their ranks and listen to the podcast without ads. If you enjoy the podcast, please consider leaving a review on Apple Podcasts or recommend it to a friend. For other great podcasts on the Airwave Network, such as the History of the Second World War, check out airwavemedia.com. Thank you to Sounds Like an Earful for the interval music in today's episode, to my entire House of Lords, and to you for listening. Step into the world of power, loyalty, and luck. I'm going to make him an offer he can't refuse. With family, cannolis, and spins mean everything. Now, you want to get mixed up in the family business. Introducing The Godfather at ChompaCasino.com. Test your luck in the shadowy world of The Godfather slot. Someday, I will call upon you to do a service for me. Play The Godfather now at ChompaCasino.com. Welcome to the family. VGW Group, no purchase necessary. Avoid where prohibited by law. See terms and conditions 18 plus. When you make decisions for your company, you always look for the no-brainers. And if you have a lot of mailing and shipping to do, Stamps.com is the ultimate no-brainer. It streamlines your process to make your business more efficient, which makes you less busy. Mail checks, invoices, legal documents, books, and everything you need to keep your business running with Stamps.com. Seamlessly connect with every major marketplace and shopping cart if you sell online. Schedule package pickups through the dashboard and automatically see your cheapest and fastest shipping options from different carriers with rates up to 89% off USPS and UPS rates. And with the Stamps.com mobile app, you can take care of mailing and shipping wherever you are, even on the go. Make the same no-brainer decision as over 1 million other business decision makers with Stamps.com. Sign up at Stamps.com with code PROGRAM for a special offer that includes a four-week trial, plus free postage, and a free digital scale. No long-term commitments or contracts. That's Stamps.com, code PROGRAM.